Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to my talk. My name is Jing Jing. I'm a soon to be second year uh, PhD student in neuroscience at UC Berkeley, and I'm working with Professor Ann Collins. Today I will present on my work um, on credit assignment and the learning and transfer of hierarchical options. So the, uh, a motivation behind this line of work is to understand a human's ability to generalize and transfer knowledge. Uh, let me walk you through an example of what I mean by generalizing and transferring knowledge. A human um, learns to make coffee in uh, their own coffee pot at home and they become very uh, skilled at making coffee using this pot. Uh, when they go to a friend's house, they want, to uh, they want to impress their friends by making, brewing a perfect pot of coffee. And however, this human has never made coffee in this pot before. Uh, since humans are able to generalize knowledge, this human is most likely going to be able to uh, apply the knowledge of making coffee on the old pot to the new pot, since the structure of the new pot is somewhat similar to the old pot. So the human uh, smoothly makes coffee. On the other hand, uh, when your average AI learns to make coffee uh, using a pot at home and goes to a friend's house and tries to make coffee uh, with a new pot, um, it most likely will fail this task because it probably would recognize the new coffee pot as a completely different task than making coffee in the old pot because the lower level features of the new pot are different from the lower level features of the old pot, even though they share the same latent task of making coffee. So uh, the AI most likely would learn to make coffee um, with the new pot as a new task. In this example, the human is able to efficiently transfer knowledge, whereas the AI failed to do that. In order to, um, to st like by studying um, human's ability to generalize and transfer knowledge, we hope we can um, use our discoveries to inform uh, the artificial intelligence community to build better um, and more uh, flexible um, AI architectures. Now I will use um, the example above to uh, illustrate the two main questions that we are investigating in the current work. The first question is, how is old and new knowledge credited in transfer? In this example, uh, the human learns to make coffee with the old pot and transfers that knowledge to the new pot, but does the representation of the uh, knowledge with the new pot overwrite the knowledge um, that they learned with the old pot, or does it um, not interfere with the old knowledge? And the second question is, to what extent do human generalize or transfer? After the human learns to make coffee with the old pot, um, it was, um, they are able to generalize to the new pot because it's somewhat similar to the old pot. But what if the new pot becomes more different? For example, if uh, the human were to make coffee with um, a mocha pot for the first time or um, an espresso machine, would they still be able to transfer that knowledge? To investigate this, uh, we use the theoretical framework called the hierarchical learning with options framework. Options are strategy chunks um, that extend over the dimension of time. For example, the task of making coffee can be modeled as a medium level option that can then be broken down into lower level options such as grinding beans and boiling water. And this whole set of hierarchical options can be put under another higher level option of making breakfast, which includes making coffee and making toast. The hierarchical option, uh, the hierarchical representation of options makes it very easy to flexibly transfer and recompose options together. For example, if we take the option um, MO2 of making toast and compose that with uh, the option of making soup, we can construct a new high level option of making lunch. And this uh, kind of transfer or composition can happen at any level of the hierarchy. For example, we can take uh, LO2, which is a low level option of boiling water from making coffee and compose that with um, getting tea back to make the new option of making tea. 
More formally, the options framework is a hierarchical reinforcement learning algorithm. Classic reinforcement learning involves um, learning to take primitive and single step actions that maximize future cumulative reward, which means at each decision step, the agent is only, to ch is only able to choose a single action instead of multiple actions. On the other hand, the options framework extends the traditional reinforcement learning framework to allow for um, decisions that involve multiple steps of action policies, um, which means at each decision step, the agent is not only able to choose to take a single action, but they can alternatively choose to, um, to cho choose an action policy, which is also called an option, which they can then use to generate a sequence of actions um, that form uh, hierarchies in the dimension of time. The options framework was originally uh, proposed in machine learning, but it has been used by cognitive scientists to model um, human hierarchical learning and transfer behavior. Now I will um, introduce our experimental design by walking you through a trial and then uh, formalizing the questions in the context of um, this experiment as well as our hypotheses. Uh, each trial consists of two stages. In the beginning of the first stage, the participant sees a stimulus that's specific to the first stage and they're tasked with pressing among four different keys on their keyboard in order to find the correct key that corresponds to the stimulus. If they press a, if they press a wrong key, um, they would keep seeing the stimulus until they uh, get to the correct key, which would lead the experiment to the second stage uh, where a second stage, uh, where a stimulus specific to the second stage is, is presented. And again, the task of the participant is to press them on the same four keys in order to find the one that corresponds to the stimulus. Uh, in the second stage, if the participant makes an incorrect choice, uh, they would see a feedback of um, z a zero point reward that they have gained, which is no reward. Um, and then the experiment would loop back to the second stage stimulus so they can try again. Um, until they get to the correct choice, um, the participant will see a feedback of a one-point reward, uh, which would lead to the next trial. We designed the experiment so that um, the correct choice in the second stage depends on the stimulus of the first stage. And that means um, when the participant is making a decision in the first stage, they're not only choosing an action to respond to the first stage stimulus, but they're also choosing a policy, an, an action policy that they can use to generate more actions in the second stage, and that is the uh, and that is an option. So that uh, is a is the structure of a single trial. We have 32 trials per block, um, and nine blocks in total. The first six blocks um, are the learning phase, where participants learn two sets of hierarchical options, and in in the Seventh block is the test phase where we modified or partially modified uh, the old options that participants learn in the learning phase to test for transfer. And um, in addition to that, we added two more blocks in the end of the test phase uh, to test for where we tested um, the old options that were learned in the learning phase uh, in order to answer the question of whether the options learned in the test phase would overwrite what was learned in the learning phase. Uh, here is um, an example contingency of um, both stages. In the first stage, uh, which marks uh, M01, we have a stimulus, uh, which is a circle, and the correct action corresponding to the circle uh, is the key denoted by A1. Um, after the participant presses A1 in response to the circle, uh, the experiment would move on to the second stage and the stimulus would either be a diamond or a triangle, and the correct responses corresponding to both of them are A4 and A2. Alternatively, in the same block, the participant might see um, a different first stage stimulus, which is a square. The square would lead to the same second stage stimuli as the circle, but the correct responses would be different because the first stage stimulus is different. 
in blocks, and we had an alternative um, set of options that participants also learned. Uh, so for H01, uh, which is the first set of options, participants learned um, these options in blocks one, three, and five of the learning phase, and they were retested on the set of options uh, in block nine of the post-test phase. Um, and for the second set of options, participants learned them in blocks two, four, and six um, of the learning phase, and uh, were tested on them again in block eight. For uh, block seven, where we manipulated the um, hierarchical contingencies, uh, we took the um, hierarchical options H01 and modified the contingencies of the second stage so that uh, the new uh, set of options would be partially different from H01. Uh, some previous um, results from another paper uh, published from our lab last year found that um, used the same paradigm and uh, they and they produced results for the learning phase and the test phase. In the learning phase, they found that um, the amount of error decreased over time in the first six blocks. And in the test phase, upon a, upon a change of rules, uh, the amount of error first increased, but then dropped back to baseline. Now, to frame our question in terms of um, this context, um, if participants learned all the options um, in the learning phase, did they learn, when the rules changed in block seven, the test phase, did they, did they learn options that were completely new and independent from the old options, or did they overwrite the old options um, to accommodate to the new context? In, in order to, and to phrase it in another way, uh, our question is, how are new and old options credited during transfer? In order to test for that, um, we changed the rules back to the old options in blocks eight and nine and tested for them again. We hypothesized that if old options were overridden, the amount of error after the second time when the rules changed back to the old options would increase and then decrease back to baseline. And alternatively, we hypothesized that if the new options were, cre if new options were created independently from the old options, um, then the amount of error wouldn't increase. We collected behavioral data from 228 human participants. Um, on the y-axis, I'm showing the number of key presses the participants made per trial, um, which is correlated to the amount of error. And as you can see, uh, in the learning phase, which is blocks one through six, um, the, par the participants gradually made less and less error. And in the uh, seventh block, which is the test phase where um, the hierarchical contingencies were partially changed, participants made um, more errors. And critically, in the post-test uh, post block, blocks eight and nine, where um, old options were retested, participants did not make more errors compared to the end of the learning phase, which is blocks five and six. And with that, we uh, concluded that new options were created and old options were not overwritten. Now onto our second question. Um, we want to ask to what extent this general, um, people generalize and, um, and, how that if, and how that interacts with the credit assignment question. So uh, we would like to answer the question that does Different, does how different the new options are from existing options affect credit assignment? To test for this, we um, had two alternative designs for the seventh block, which is the test block. Um, in the first design, um, two of the four second stage contingencies were changed. So um, this, this design is more similar to the, um, to the old options of H01. In the, and in the second design, all four of the um, second stage contingencies were changed, so this design is um, less similar to the um, old options of H01. We had half, half of our participants complete uh, the first design and the other half completed the second design, and we com 
uh, and we compared the performance of the two groups using a variety of metrics, including uh, the number of key presses they made, um, the accuracy of the first press, and the error types of the first press, and we found that there was no significant difference between the two groups. And so um, that led us to the conclusion that this uh, credit assignment process is not affected by how similar or different the new options are to the old options. In addition to the behavioral analysis, we also did some computational modeling. Uh, we par particularly, we evaluated the option model from the Shan Collins 2021 paper. Um, the option model implements the options framework um, and it provides both state and temporal abstraction. I will, uh, I will omit the math, uh, the mathematical details of the model here, but if you're curious, I encourage you to check out our paper. Uh, now, moving on to the modeling results. We, uh, since our model is not directly fittable, uh, because uh, there are some latent variables that we were not able to observe from our human participants, uh, we tuned the parameters by hand to match human performance with our model. And as you can see, we were able to make the option model replicate human behavior pretty well. Uh, cru crucially, it was able to replicate the no difference in performance between the two groups. In conclusion, uh, for our credit assignment question, during transfer, new options are created and old options are not overwritten. In other words, credit is assigned to new options instead of old options. This credit assignment is not affected by how similar the new options are to old options, as we did not observe any performance differences uh, between our two groups. And finally, the option model uh, was able to ap accurately capture human behavior and credit assignment during transfer, um, and this adds to the evidence to support the argument that the options framework is a valid framework to model human hierarchical learning and transfer behavior. With that, I would like to say special thanks to Professor Ann Collins for personally supervising this project, uh, Jimmy, a former grad student in our lab for framing the project and building the groundwork for it, our wonderful RAs for helping with data collection, and our COXI reviewers and uh, lab members for providing helpful feedback on our manuscript, presentations, and posters. And thank you for your attention. I will be happy to take any questions. In education, a uh, very big problem that people try to address is distant transfer, where the stimuli change superficially, so that you are, but the uh, policy may be the same. I mean, uh, grinding and boiling may apply in other domains than making coffee, and, but the st stimuli may be uh, quite different looking and the situation may be very different. So I'm wondering um, if the kind of uh, modeling you're doing with the uh, with the uh, policies and the credit assignments could uh, uh, explain or explain the failure to uh, for uh, people not being able to transfer to distant stimuli where the um, where the superficial stimuli are different even though the structure of the situation is is, is the same yeah that is a really good question um, I think for our current experiment we're since we're using the same stimuli for all of the for all of the conditions. Um, it's not best suited to answer a question like that, but um, one of our future directions that we're heavily considering is to expand the state space or stimuli space uh, so that we can incorporate more changes and in dimensions in the, in the learning environment and also add, potentially add more dynamics in it uh, to make the task more complex and so, um, it would also be more powerful and enable us to answer more questions like this. Are there any online questions, technical chair? 
No, we don't have questions on them. All right, then let's get a round of applause. Next, we have uh, Joseph. <laughs>